sets of matrices. The first set contains M1 and M2. The second set contains N1 and N2. And what we want to test is the following. We would like to know, is M1 equal to A to the minus 1 N1A and M2 equal to A to the minus 1 N2A. So are those two sets of matrices related by similarity transform? Now, the first thing that you might say is easy. M1 is going to have the same eigenvalues as N1. And M2 will have the same eigenvalues as N2. So you might say, well, all that I have to check is, is trace of M1 to the power of N equal to the trace of N1 to the power of N. And second condition now is trace M2 to the power of N equal to the trace of N2 to the power of N. But that's not good enough. And the reason why that's not good enough is these equations would be true. This is also true if M1 is related by similarity transform to N1 and if M2 is related to similarity transform to N2, but a different similarity transform. Certainly, these eigenvalues would still be equal to those. And these eigenvalues would be equal to those. We need to require something extra, which will tell us the similarity transform we're performing for N1 is the same as the similarity transformation we're performing here for N2. What is the extra condition? Well, let's call these two equations over here 1. And let's call these equations over here 2. And there is a difference between 1 and 2. We look at 1 from 1, we know the following. If we take m1 times m2, this is equal to a to the minus 1, n1, a, a to the minus 1, n2, a. a onto a to the minus 1 is the identity. So we get a to the minus 1, n1, n2, a. So what we learn is if we perform the same similarity transform in M1 and M2, then the product M1, M2 is similar to N1, N2. That is not true for 2. If we look at 2, in this case, M1, M2 would be equal to um, A to the minus 1, N1, A, A tilde to the minus 1, N2, A tilde. And in fact, those two will not be equal to the identity. There is no obvious relationship between M1, M2 and N1, N2, which doesn't even appear on this side. So you can see that the, the new condition that we have to, to impose, this would certainly do it, if we take the trace of any string of matrices, and that is equal to the trace... of any string of the corresponding matrices, then we know that these two sets are related by similarity transform. Is everybody happy with that? That's the basic idea. Now let's apply that to groups. If I compose an arbitrary string of group elements, what will I get back? A group element, right? So if these were a whole bunch of matrices belonging to a group, this composition would itself be a group element. And if this was a whole bunch of matrices belonging to a group, this would also just reduce to a single group element. So if two groups are equivalent, if two reps, if two representations are equivalent, Okay, then we know that the trace of the matrix, the matrix representing a certain group element will be equal to the trace of the matrix representing the group element in the other representation. So if this is true, we 
say gamma and gamma tilde are equivalent. We introduce a name for this. Um, the trace of gamma Ti is called the character of group element Ti in representation gamma. And we say that the condition that the two representations are equivalent is that they have the same character system. So if you calculate the characters for all of the group elements, they will be equal to the characters of the other representation. Yes, Noreen? Yep, that's what we're assuming. We, we, we're always assuming we've got a matrix red. Okay? Is that always the case? Um, Jim, maybe you can help here. Okay. The point is that there are groups that don't have matrix representations, the simplest ones translations. Oh, right, good point. Okay, yeah. Um, you know, Noreen, okay, so, so Jim probably knows much more about this than I do, but I, um, I, I, the, the following statement is often made. Um, if you want to build a string field theory, what you want is you want a product that's associative. And it's really tough to find products that are associative. We don't know many examples of that. Um, one of the examples that we do know is matrix multiplication. That's certainly associative. And that's why matrix, matrices play such a big role in group theory. This is a natural way to build in the associativity uh, properly. We now know of some others like the Moyol star and things like that. It's um, an important fact that they're associative. Okay, so we've now got um, the condition that two representations are equivalent. Okay, um, so, so what I would now like to do with the last few minutes of this lecture is summarize what we've done again, set things up for what we're going to do tomorrow, and then take any questions. So, so what did we do? We started off and we said we want to figure out what are good labels for a particle. Um, we then said that what a good label for a particle would be, it would be something that wouldn't change, for example, if we were to change the momentum of our particle. An electron could have any momentum. We wouldn't like to, to start making a mistake about whether a particle is an electron or not just because it had a certain momentum and not some other momentum. So we said, how can we find the set of labels that we could use to label our particle? Well, we introduced transformations. When we apply this transformation to our electron wave function, we, we may imagine that perhaps it would displace our electron or it may rotate our electron. And then our task was to find those set of labels which were invariant under the set of transformations. Notice I've not yet told you which set of transformations we could consider. Um, and we'll, we'll consider different sets and slowly zone in on the set of representations which is useful. Um, we then abstracted four properties of any um, set of transformations, and we came up with our definition of a group, which is here. So there were four basic properties. Closure, under composition, there was an identity, there was an inverse, and associativity of our composition law. Um, so, so that was our definition of the group. We then said, hang on, any set of transformations is consistent with this. What extra piece of information that can we give that would single out a particular group? Well, that piece of information we said was a multiplication table. And we found that when we wanted to find a set of objects which realize that multiplication table, there are many different set of objects together with composition rules that would realize that multiplication table. We wanted to distinguish between these explicit realizations, which may have special properties not shared by the abstract group itself, so we call these explicit representations of the abstract group representations of the group. We then wanted to know, well, how many representations are there? And we found that even if we just had a single representation, we could form an infinite number of equivalent representations, and we could also form an infinite number of representations which are reducible from that single um, representation. So what we've learned is, in general, there are an infinite number of representations. But if we focus, if we make a list, and on our list we only included representations which were inequivalent, so representations which cannot be related in that way, 
and representations which are irreducible, which means representations which cannot be blocked diagonal, then if our group has finite order, we would only have a finite number of these inequivalent irreducible building blocks appearing on that list. And then the last thing that we did today is we actually figured out um, a test to tell whether two representations would be equivalent or not. And we found that that was obtained by comparing the characters of the two representations, which are given just by taking the trace of the group elements. Tomorrow, what we're going to start off doing is we're going to start off asking how good our characterization of the group in terms of its multiplication table is. So maybe that's something for you to think about. Imagine you wanted to write down the multiplication table for the group of rotations or the group of translations. How far would you get? Okay? So, so that's perhaps something to think about for tomorrow's lecture. Are there any questions on what we did today? I have a question. Yes. A suggestion for the students. Okay. Tell them to find the three-dimensional representation of the group that you've written here. Ah. Talk about its characters compared to the representation that you have. Okay. To find a three-dimensional representation of the group that we were looking at, calculate its characters, um, and see what you notice. Yeah. Are there any questions? Mm -hmm. How would you be able to tell when you've got all of the reducible, irreducible representations? Ah, there? good question. So what we'll be able to do is, we'll actually be able to derive how many of them there are. Okay? So we'll be able to derive a formula which tells us exactly how many um, irreducible, inequivalent representations a finite group has. Okay, so that's one of the things that we'll be doing. Any other questions? Yes, Noreen. If I compose any two elements of the group, I'll get an element of the group. Okay? So there, I'm at uh, two. Yes. So it must hold for every element in the group. So how many conditions would we need to check? G, the order of the group number of conditions. Trace of each element in the two reps would have to be equal. And that immediately implies that the traces of any string of elements would be equal. Okay, so that was a good question. Any other questions? Okay, then I guess it's time to break the tea. <laughs>